Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to class on the Haggadah, Haggadah in depth. And we'll, and we'll focus specifically on the Dayenu prayer, the Dayenu song that we all love and we all know that we sing at our uh, at our Seder. So, uh, you know, Passover, Pesach is just around the corner, just less, less than uh, two weeks away, a week and a half. Monday night, we'll be sitting around the Seder at a table with our, hopefully with our friends and family, and we'll be reading the Haggadah, right? <laughs> you know, this is, you know, although uh, the Seder is obviously a meal, we come to have a good brisket, a good piece of flesh, but uh, obviously, uh, before that comes the Haggadah, we got to tell over the story, tell over the story of, 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 of the Exodus of Egypt. And it goes late. We know it goes late. Uh, I like to say the story where uh, someone says, my neighbor, oh, horrible. I have awful neighbors. You know what happened early this morning? 3 a.m. 3 a.m. My neighbor is knocking on my door. How crazy is that? Luckily, I was up playing drums. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, we know the Seder goes late, but uh, there's so much. It's, it's so rich, the Haggadah, each 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 passage. Uh, we don't always, always have the time at the Seder itself to delve into the depth of each of these passages. But if we do have the time before to prepare ourselves for Pesach, uh, it's important to uh, to, to uh, understand the, the, the significance, the meaning behind these passages. So we're we'll focus today on the on the Dayeno. We'll see how much we can get through. Um, and I think there's a powerful message in addition to the message of gratitude, how to show appreciation, how to give thanks. But there's also a a, a theme of freedom, which is the theme of the, the, of, the of of the night of Pesach. Um, how to celebrate freedom as Jewish people? How to celebrate freedom? I think we can see that already in. Or hinted to already in the in the in the Dayenu. So the Dayenu, and we all know the song. Ilu ilu hotziyano hotziyano mi mitzrayim hotziyano mi mitzrayim Dayen Day Dayenu. Right? What does Dayenu mean? Dayenu means it's enough. It's a way of giving thanks, and we enumerate, we we list the various. Um, uh, Miracles and things that the uh, Hashem has done, God has done for us, uh, from when we left Egypt through our time receiving the Torah and through going into the into Israel, and we say for each one, Dayenu. If it was only this, it would have been enough. But God did even more, and if it was only that, it would have been enough. And God did even more and more and more. So we we have to give thanks to Hashem. Interestingly. This passage, this uh, prayer of the Dayenu, isn't found in the uh, the earliest uh, versions of the Haggadah. The Haggadah was written sometime during the second, the end of the Second Temple era, uh, two thousand years ago plus. And uh, unlike the Siddur, the Haggadah is actually mentioned in the Talmud. But the uh, this this section in the, in the earliest Agada, the earliest version of the Agada, the Dayeno is not mentioned. However, it's understood by some that the author of the Dayeno prayer was actually Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva, who we just you know previously in the Haggadah, we mentioned Rabbi Akiva's opinion about the various uh, miracles, additional miracles that that that. that God performed in Egypt and at the, at the sea. So it's understood that this is a continuation of Rabbi Akiva's statement. Rabbi Akiva is the one who uh, numerated all the Dayenus and, and he wrote basically, he authored this prayer. The prayer, whether it was Rabbi Akiva or someone else, is uh, seems to be based on a uh, psalm. If you open your psalm, uh, to Psalm 135, you'll find something also very fascinating. King David, writing in Psalm 135, does something very similar. He also goes through 
the uh, the various uh, miracles that God has performed for the Jewish people. And he doesn't just say, thank you, Hashem, thank you, God, but he enumerates each one specifically. There's also a Midrash that does something similar. So it seems that, that uh, this may be based on that, on these ideas that uh, we enumerate our gratitude, which, by the way, is a very uh, powerful message in how to give gratitude. How to show appreciation, right? You can come home from uh, a long day of work and you can tell your wife, thank you. Thank you for everything. You know, they say the story where uh, someone comes home after a, a long day of work and boy, does he find the house turned upside down. Chaos. His children are running around barefoot. There is uh, toys everywhere. There is a cereal and milk from the morning that's still spilled over the counters, still, uh, over the, the kitchen table. The, the faucet is running. The bat, the bathtub is overflowing. There's there's food and, and clothes and, and and food and toys everywhere. The house is literally as if like a tornado just hit the house. And he's looking for his wife. He says, "Honey, honey, where are you? Where are you?" And finally, he comes into the bedroom. He sees his wife laying in bed reading a book, drinking a tea, calm like anything as if nothing's nothing's going wrong. Honey, what's going on over here? You don't see the house is turned upside down. So she says, honey, you know when you come home often, you ask me, what did you do today? Well, today I didn't do it. So you got to show appreciation. You got to show our gratitude. And say thanks for those who uh, who help us, who contribute to us. But there are two ways to do it. One way is to come home and say, thank you. Great job. Thank you so much. Which is nice, important. I right? should always verbalize our thanks. Many times we have a thanks uh, appreciation in our mind. And we truly are pre appreciative in our mind. In our mind, we think, wow, this person has helped me out so much. I really appreciate what they have done. But we don't take the time to verbalize it, to write a note make a phone call, to say thank you so much, right? So that's already step number one. That's important. However, you can't compare that one thank you to someone coming home and say, wow, I noticed that you have done this. Thank you. And not only that, you've also done this and that and the other. Wow, right? If you enumerate, that you specify each thing, each item, you itemize, right? We're talking in the tax season now, right? If you itemize, if you itemize each thanks and say, I appreciate this, and I appreciate this, and I appreciate this, it show, the, the, the recipient the recipient appreciates it. And it also is indicative. It shows that the uh, the person saying the thank you notices the nuances. He notices the details. And the person appreciates. So when I appreciate what my parents did, I appreciate what my spouse does. I appreciate what my children do. I appreciate what coworkers or other people in the community have done. And I say, not just thank you for everything, which is a beautiful thing to say. Thank you for everything. But if I say, thank you for X, Y, and Z. Thank you for all these 25 things you have done. Thank you for this. And that. that shows that, wow, I really appreciate. I notice the hard work that was put into it. Notice the details. And we appreciate every single thing. So the same is true when we show appreciation to Hashem. We can say, Thank you, Hashem. Thank you for everything that you have done for me. Everything that you are doing for me. It's wonderful. But if I say thank you, and it's not specifying, thank you for life. Thank you for eyesight. Thank you for clothing. Thank you that I'm healthy. Thank you that I have uh, a house, uh, a roof over my head. Thank you that I have a family. Right? If I specify all the thank yous, oh, Show the shows that I I I I notice and I and I appreciate each each thing in my life. Which, by the way, in the, every morning, when we the first thing we do in our morning prayers is we say these blessings and we specify the various areas, the basics that we have, the life that we know, and we and we say thank you. So the same is true with the dayenu. I want to read some of the dayenus, and then perhaps talk about how this uh, gives us a, a, an insight to what freedom is supposed to look like. So it starts off like this. How many virtues, how many great uh, things that, 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 that God has done for us that we have to give thanks? And he enumerates 
in our in our, in our version of the Adayin, it's 14, 14 things. Uh, seeming, seemingly in the in the original prints, actually in, in the first print in, in, in uh, I think it was in the 1400s, the or the 1300s, the first print of the Haggadah, there was actually 15. There was an extra. The last two were, the last one was split in two. Either way, we start off, if you have taken us out of Egypt, but you do not on the side, you do not make these miracles, ten plagues and others. Just take us out of Egypt. That would have been enough. That would have been enough. The fact that you also had all these miracles and plagues, wow, that's, that's over the top. Wow, thank you. If you have done all these miracles and plagues for the for the Egyptians, however, will they also be like Kaham and you did not strike their gods? That would have been enough. If you have stricken their gods, but you did not kill their firstborn, that would have been enough. If you have killed, if you have done all the above. And also, you have done the uh, stricken, you, 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 you struck the uh, the firstborn of the Egyptians, but you have not given us their money. As we know, that when the Jewish people left Egypt, they were filled with donkeys and donkeys, piles and piles of of riches of, of, of all their all their all their money that 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 they, that they have given the Jewish people when they left. But so if you didn't, didn't do that, ah, would have been enough. But you also gave us our money. Wow, it's amazing. Even us, given them all their, the, the, uh, given us all their money, but like and but you have not split the sea for us. Then, would have been enough. Wait, stop there for a moment. If God didn't split the sea, what would have happened? The Egyptians who were behind us would have attacked. I mean. Great to be saved that from Egypt, but if you don't have the miracle of the splitting of the sea, it's all for nothing. So what what are we thanking God for? If you have taken us out of Egypt, giving us all the money, and not split the sea, ah, would have been enough. What's the point to die to die with riches? Why it's like a person who tells who says in his will that you should put all, all all my wealth should go in the grave with me. You know what happened? He went to a, the story with the son that leaves all the wealth to to, to his son. Three million dollars in the bank. I want you to take out all the three million dollars, and I want to place that with me. I want you to place it with me in my grave. So, what does the son do? He writes a check from his uh, father's account, three million dollars, and he puts a check in the grave. Okay, but the point is, what would have happened? If the Jewish people were were at the sea, and there wasn't it wasn't split. What are we thanking God for? So, one of the explanations given is. That the splitting of the sea was for a purpose. It was for the miracle of the splitting of the sea. If God wasn't planning on splitting the sea, he could have caused the Egyptians to, to return to Egypt and not chase us. Maybe with those a different routes. So, so so the 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 thanks is not that we that God that God didn't kill us or didn't 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 allow us to die and be killed by the Egyptians. We're thanking God that he orchestrated in a way where he was able to bring about this great miracle of splitting the sea, he could have saved us without the miracle of splitting the sea. We go on talking about if a God has split the sea but not brought us uh, through in uh, in dry land, right? So could it, what if it was a little wet, right? A little, some puddles, right? We know in New Orleans what it means to have a, a wet day. Right, as we all had yesterday. So it would have been some puddles. What's going to happen? Nothing, right? But God made it dry. We're able to walk a dry land within the sea. Wow, that extra detail we are taking notice of, and we're thanking Hashem that you made it so convenient for us that we're able to walk on dry land when we split the sea. And then we continue talking about if we would have went through dry land, but our enemies did not have to perish as well. In the water, that would have been enough. If our enemies also uh, drowned in the water, but God did not provide for all our needs for uh, forty years in the desert, right? This is reference to the manna from heaven. We didn't get all the our needs directly from God for forty years. It also would have been enough. We stop there. Would have been enough. what would have happened? 
If I would have went through the de desert for 40 years without having any food, how would I have I survived? What am I thinking, Hashem, for? So the answer is that, you know what? If you have 2 million people stationed in the desert, you know what was happening? They were merchants coming from the other various cities and countries surrounding the, de the desert, and they would have come and sold us stuff, right? What would have happened? Would have all died of, of hunger. We could have went into other places and purchased food. So it's not as convenient. So we're thanking Hashem. You didn't allow us to fend for ourselves and figure out how to live in the desert with, with, with all that we need. But you provided effortless, effortless um, uh, food come out every morning out of a tent, and there it is, waiting for us. For that, we give you thanks. If you have not done that, would have been enough. But you also gave us that uh, you know, the money from heaven for 40 years. Money from heaven and also other things, right? So, uh, so the next step is if you're not giving us all all that we need in the in, in the in the in the desert and you and you and you're only giving us the mana, if you would have given everything but not the mana, it would have been fine. If you're giving us the mana and not giving us the Shabbos, the holy Shabbos, we have got to thank Hashem for this special gift of Shabbos, which we got already before Mount Sinai, already right after we got this the the the, the, the uh, instruction of the mana, we already also got. The idea of not to collect on, uh, the money on Shabbos, we should collect two portions on Friday. That gift of Shabbos, if you didn't give, get Shabbos, it would have been enough. If God has given us the Shabbos and not brought us to, to Mount Sinai, it uh, would have been enough. If he brought us to Mount Sinai, not giving us the Torah, would have been enough. Just being at Mount Sinai, the revelation of God, that was enough. You also gave us the Torah, the Ten Commandments, and the whole Torah later. Wow. If he has given us the Torah and not brought us into Israel, would have been enough. If he brought us into Israel but has not built a temple in Jerusalem for us, that would have been enough. That the fact that you have done all these things for us, you took us out of Egypt and you you played the the, 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 the Egyptians and not only the Egyptians but also their gods. And you you struck their firstborns, and you gave us their money, and you split the sea, and you took us in dry land, and you provided, and you uh caused our enemies to drown, and you provided all that we need for forty years, and you gave us the month, and you gave us the Shabbos, and you brought us to Har Sinai, and you gave us the Torah, and you brought us to Israel, and you also built the temple. Wow! Thank you, thank you, thank you. This is a beautiful prayer, the song of thanks that. We have that we have in in the in the Haganda, and it's no surprise that this, this is, has become like a staple. Many families, even those who perhaps do not have time to go through every single passage of the Haganda, uh, but the Dayenu, who I how can you have a seder without singing Dayenu? Such an important uh, lesson in uh, giving thanks, and it's not only a lesson. We have to give thanks. We have to recognize all that God has done when we're talking about the exodus of Egypt. It's not enough only to talk about the story, to recount what happened, but we also have to take a, take a moment to thank Hashem every year for all the specifics that happened in the story of the exodus of Egypt. But I want to just take note on the last, the last idea over here. Because the night of Passover, the night of Pesach, it's a night that we are focused, really, really zeroed in to the idea of the exodus of Egypt. Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim. We are talking about what happened when we left Egypt. And we talk about the various miracles and all that happened. Jewish people have a long history. The history began with the exodus of Egypt, and it continues till today. And if we have to talk about the history of the Jewish people, right? You can buy the book, history, you know, the, the history of Jewish, of Jewish people in a nutshell, or a crash course on Jewish history, right? It's not, it's, it's not one night. It's not one night, right? There's a lot to talk about. It, it doesn't end with, right, with going into Israel. It doesn't end with building the temple. There was Joshua, and then there was the, the judges, and the prophets, and the kings, and I mean, the, the, right? It goes on and on and on and on, right? So, 
seemingly when we're thanking Hashem for the, the, the miracles of of the Exodus, wh where do we end, right? Where do we say, okay, this is the story of the Exodus, this is where it's at, and then thank you for that. And the rest, obviously, we always thank Hashem for all the miracles. So we have the Exodus of Egypt. Now, the Exodus of Egypt seemingly wasn't complete until the Egyptians were destroyed. Okay, so we have the splitting of the sea. But once the, once the sea was split, and once our enemies were drowned in the sea, that's it. We're done, we're done with Egypt. We have ex exited Egypt. We have left Egypt. We are free people. We have gained our freedom. Done. Exodus of Egypt is done. Okay, you can tell me that the uh, the purpose of the e leaving Egypt was, was to receive the Torah on Mount Sinai. Okay, receive the Torah on Mount Sinai. Then we have 40 years in the desert. Going into Israel. And not only going into Israel, but building the temple. Why is all this included into our thanks to God when we're talking about the exodus of Egypt? I mean, we can go on, right? This building the temple, thank you for, for the other various miracles that happened in the temple, in the past temple era. You have King David, you have King Solomon, you have the various kings, the various wars that, were, that, that, that we won. I mean, on and on and on and on, right? The miracle of Hanukkah, the miracle of Purim. I mean, where do we stop? So the exodus of Egypt seemingly doesn't stop with the exodus. It doesn't stop with splitting of the sea. It doesn't stop with receiving the Torah. It goes all the way to going into Israel. Not only that, building a temple. Building a temple. Where at the temple is the time where we're able to serve God to our fullest. So I think the fact that this was included into in the Dayanas, perhaps or Akiva, who or or whoever the, the author of the Dayana was, and the fact that it was accepted that we every year on Pesach we read the entire the, the Dayana, it's because it has very much to do with the theme of freedom uh, on the night of Pesach. The night of Pesach, we talk about our freedom, Zman Chedoseinu, the era, the time of our freedom. What's freedom? How is Pesach our freedom? Seemingly from all the holidays of the year, I would say Pesach is the least of our freedom. <laughs> what goes on in a Jewish home on Pesach, weeks before preparing, scrubbing, cleaning, cooking, whatnot, the stress levels go up, the anxiety is up. What's going to be? What, what are we serving? Who's coming? How many guests do we have? Where are we getting the matzah from? Where are we getting the harot? Right? There's so much work. This is freedom. You know what freedom is? Freedom is booking two tickets to the Bahamas for, for a week. That's freedom. You can relax, joy, no pressure, no hosting, no rules, no chametz, ma ma matzah. I mean, all everything. This is freedom. This is freedom is enjoying yourself, going on a nice vacation. So, what's freedom really all about? So, freedom, as we know, there's two. Two stages in our freedom, two uh, forms of freedom. Some refer to it as freedom from and freedom to. Freedom from our limitations and freedom to live our life true to ourselves. That's two stages in freedom. Think, for example, a uh, an inmate, someone in prison. Are they free? Eh, not necessarily, right? There are out, outside outside limitations that uh, restrict this person's freedom. They can't go wherever they want. They can't make their own decisions. They have to be at certain places at certain times. They have to answer to certain people. We can't, uh, right? We're not free. There are outside external limitations to us. We're not freedom from at the outside world. There are we, we are in prison. Okay, that's not a free person. The moment the person leaves a, a, a prison, oh, my the shackles are, are removed, the bars are removed. I'm not uh, physically limited. I can make my own decisions. I can run my own life. Now I have freedom from. I have freedom from the external limitations. Don't tell me what to do. 
I can make my own choices. That's freedom from. And often we get stuck at this stage in our freedom. As long as no one's telling me, no one's dictating how I should live my life, I am a free person. That's freedom. Freedom means I make my own choices. The land of the free. What does that mean? Fend for your own, for yourself, and make your own choices. No one tells you what to do. No one tells you what to wear. No one tells you what time you have to get up. No one tells you where to live. No one, you don't need permission to do to, to do anything. As long as you're not violating other people's rights and other people's uh, privacy, I'm a free person. That's freedom. We're not living in a communist country. We're not living in a, in a dictatorship. We're living in a place where I can do whatever I want. As long as I'm not hurting other people, I can do whatever I want. Okay, that's freedom. Okay. But is that, that so that's freedom from. Nothing external is limiting me, is restricting me. But what about stage number two in freedom? Freedom two. Do I have the freedom to live a life true to myself? A, free, a life of productivity, a meaningful life. Going to, with this analogy of inmates, people who are in prison, unfortunately, the, the, tr the, 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 the unfortunate truth is that many people, especially those who have been behind bars for, 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 for decades, for, for a very long time, they lost their uh, their 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 uh, sense and their capabilities of living a productive life. They're so used to living a life just uh, by 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 following instructions and, and guidance from others. They don't know how to be responsible and live a productive life. Many people don't know how to hold a job, how to be responsible, to wake up in the morning and uh, go to work and hold the job. And come home and, and not, not get involved in, in another garbage out there because they don't have the tools, they lack the tools to live a life true to themselves, a meaningful life. So they're free from external limitations. They they can make their own choices, but the choices that they make are very poor choices because they don't have the freedom to live a healthy lifestyle. And the same is true with ourselves. Take religion out of the picture for a moment, right? We have the freedom to do whatever we want. But sometimes we don't have the freedom to live a good life. We make poor choices. I can do whatever I want. I could drink a 60, a 32 uh, ounce uh, a cup of, uh, of Coke. No problem, right? Well, is that healthy? What's that going to do to you? I could eat all that I want. All the unhealthy foods, but am I truly free or am I giving in to my temptations? I'm not free. In other words, I, I'm free from nothing external is telling me what to do, but I'm not free to live a life that I really want to live. That's good for me, that I'm meant to live. Someone who's on drugs, someone who has, who has an addiction. So the, so the addict will say, well, I'm free to make my own choices. Don't tell me what to do, which is true. They have the freedom to make their own choices. But they're lacking the freedom to make the good choices. Choices that they're meant to make as a human being, that are healthy for them. So you, we can't get stuck at, at stage one of freedom. We have to realize that freedom also means living a life true to ourselves. Living a life that breathes out the best of us. That, that comes with restrictions. That actually does come with self-imposed restrictions. So I restrict my eating. I restrict how many hours I waste on social media. I restrict how many hours I, I sleep. I don't sleep in every day because I know I have to get up in the morning to go to work. So these are restrictions that we bring upon ourselves. But these restrictions are not restrictions per se. They're really they're not the lack of freedom, but they're, they are actually an expression of our freedom. Because our freedom is to live a good life. Living a good life comes with restrictions. I want to be a doctor. 
I'm going to have to put in many, many, many difficult hours to achieve that. But that's my freedom. That is freedom. Not that I have, a, I have the freedom to make choices. Making these choices brings out the freedom of living a good life, living a productive life, living a life contributing to society. That's freedom. And the same is true with our Judaism as well. God gives us restrictions. And some may say, well, where's my freedom? I want to eat my chametz on Pesach or throughout the, throughout the year. I want to live a free life. Don't tell me how many rules I have, the do's and the don'ts, because I'm free. And the truth is, yes, you have your own choices. You can make your own choices. You, you have your freedom. You don't have to follow the rules of the Torah. It's up to you. However, following the rules of the Torah, because God knows what's best for the Jew, that is only a way of expressing our freedom. Freedom comes with restrictions. But the restrictions are meant to bring out the best of us. And the best for us, for our soul, is to have these restrictions. And that is also what we say in the Dayan. We're talking about freedom. We left Egypt. Great. God split the sea. He saved us. The Egyptians are gone. We're free from the Egyptians. We're free from that outside force, that outside limitation, this force that was limiting us. Now we're we can run around freely. We're not on a, on a leash anymore. That's freedom from. That's stage one of freedom, which is important and, and it's great. But we can't stop there. True exodus of Egypt, true freedom, is when we also tap into our inner uh, self, our neshama, and say, "What is best for us?" that we serve God, that we build a temple and we accept upon us of the yoke of heaven. These restrictions are not shouldn't be seen as restrictions. They should be seen as living a healthy life. You, do, you, you go swimming, you make a, there's a lot of rules. Don't splash and don't run and don't dive and don't this and don't, right? All the do's and the don'ts. If we were just focusing on, focusing on that, so much, so many restrictions. But these restrictions are really all about what? Swim in a healthy manner and have fun. Right? It comes with restrictions. As a Jew, live a good life and connect with God comes with restrictions. But this is really our freedom. So when we're singing the Dayenu, we're singing about our freedom. What is that, our freedom? Not only that we left Egypt, but that God gave us Shabbos, part of our freedom. That God gave us the Torah, part of our freedom. Then we went into Israel and we built this temple, a place that we could serve God. This is our freedom. And this is what we're telling ourselves on the night of Passover. The time of our freedom. Freedom doesn't mean just the lack of a yoke of heaven, the lack of restriction, the lack of anything to tell me what to do. Freedom is living the best life that we can live. And the best life that we can live is following God in His Torah, living productive, a productive life, with the limitations that it comes with, because ultimately, that is our freedom. So I'll leave you with that. A little thought on our uh, Haggadah, on the, on the Dayenu, and hopefully when we sing this Dayenu this year, we'll have uh, an extra an extra understanding of what it means to thank God, what it means to show gratitude, what it means to celebrate our freedom on the night of Passover. And as we say every year, and we conclude the Haggadah, the Shana Haba'ah, the Yerushalayim, next year in Jerusalem. And it's not too late. What we said last year could happen this year. We got another week and a half. It could happen. We could be sitting in Jerusalem celebrating together as the Jewish people the night of the Seder. I'll leave you with that. Thank you so much for joining us. Wish you